<laughs> vodka. It's gonna be very chill, okay? So is everyone okay? Everybody, I don't know if I can find it. Figure it out. Um, you see us? Okay. If you're sharing it, then we're good. <laughs> so um, hello, everyone, and everyone at home. This is gonna be very. I don't know if we talk to this thing. Okay. So everyone at home, welcome. Uh, this is my uh, very first uh, podcast slash vodcast, and um, yeah, it's a bit of a long story. How did I come to this? Um, I've always wanted to do, uh, especially in the last three years, I have noticed a lot of times that I've met so many incredibly inspired and inspiring people in my work as an activist and as a queer activist and organizer. Um, I've met amazing uh, black feminists, um, amazing LGBT trans activists. I've met, you know, uh, economists and, 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 you know, sort of people who are so engaged in society on a daily basis. I meet them at marches. I meet them at my house. I meet them um, in, these, in these settings that are very private and, um, but also sort of hidden, right? And I've come... Uh, often to the to the idea when I was in the middle of a conversation and I'm like, oh my God, this conversation is great. And I'm like, I wish I could record this. I wish I could share this with the world and not having the facility or the means to. So I started playing with this in my head with this idea of having a podcast. Now, um, I've mentioned this idea to a bunch of people. Uh, the very first people who said, okay, we love this idea. Let's do it. How can we help you? was The Hague Peace Project. They work here in the Netherlands, in, in The Hague. It's a very grassroots organization. And a lot of the Hague Peace Project people are organizing the Freedom Book Fair, right? So they were like, well, we think it's really fun, this idea. Why don't you invite some of these people that you would like to talk to, and we'll set it up, and you can have your first uh, podcast. They didn't say that it was going to be live. And that it was also going to be <laughs> with a video. So this is the first. And uh, I'm, a, I'm a little bit nervous. But I hope y'all can help me through this. So the very first person I got to invite um, was Rajita Aziz. Rajita Aziz, I met her the first time in Brussels. I had been invited to a, um, I don't know, does it sound OK? Am I sounding close enough? OK. So um, I was invited to uh, uh, by a diplomatic organization, the Bure. The Bure. The Bure. It's a it's a culture house. It's a culture house, yes. And we were invited, and I was invited to come and do a speech of about five minutes, um, sort of having the scenario: if I could be president of Europe, what would be my sort of uh, uh, promotional speech? How would I get people to vote for me? So. I go there, and there were a number of people who were invited as well from different disciplines, and one of the people was Ashida Aziz, and all the other people on the panel of the speakers were white, and all the other people in the audience were all white, the organization was all white, and I felt really awkward <laughs> and very scared, uh, but they paid real good money, so. <laughs> and they paid a ticket in a hotel, so I don't, I was not gonna go. I get there, and you were there, and, and, and I remember I, had, I, w I was told that I had to debate with these men, and, and Rashida was sitting there, and she was like, I'm not debating any of them. And I was like, what? That's a possible, you can do that? <laughs> Since then, I've followed her work. Uh, you organize a, a, a Le Spas, huh? so it's a, it's a, could you explain a little bit what Le Spas is? A little, because I think you can best. I can do that, but first I'm going to tell you a little secret about that date. I okay. haven't told you before. Um, I got an email from the Bure asking me to propose myself as a candidate for European presidential elections. And then I, w I, I looked at the list of names of the other person and said they were all white men. Yeah. And then I saw that they were paying big money, though, you know? <laughs> and then I, I, I answered their email by saying, listen, guys, I do need the money, and actually I do want to do this because yeah. I do have something to say about it. But you and I both know you're asking me as a token, as I can see that the rest of the panel are all white males. I, I refuse to be used as a token. I, I know I will be used as one in this panel anyways, but could you please find just one other token so that okay. we can be two? <laughs> that's good. And that's when they... Oh, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> you got me all that money. <laughs> I really appreciate it. <laughs> <laughs> See, that's what I call solidarity right there. Mm -hmm. No, it was, it was really interesting, and I remember your speech 
left us all stunned into silence and and also into emotion like it was a very moving uh, speech which basically left everyone sitting in the room um unable to like i even i was sitting there thinking i cannot not claim responsibility for the european project and what it does to people and what how it marginalizes people and how it leaves people on the side so that speech was amazing and then i heard about your work with l'espace yeah so i would like oh, thank you. So Le Space is um, it's a very new concept mm -hmm. uh, of, for uh, a, a culture, art and culture house mm -hmm. slash cafe. Um, it's something that actually uh, came after reflecting on art and culture policy that's been going on for the last decades, mm -hmm. where we tried to engage with the culture houses mm -hmm. in a dialogue of how to reform and change the policy mm -hmm. in terms to, uh, you know, be more not just representative, but be houses of the local communities of the cities. And after decades of working with them, basically, we all realized that all they were able to do was the same, you know, diversiteit uh, beleid that ended up in using us as tokens okay. because the approach was always one of be representative of diversity. But when you seek representation, you lock up cultures and ethnicities in boxes and you mm -hmm. approach them from that perspective. Mm -hmm. But as I live in Brussels and in Brussels we have, it's the most, one of the most diverse city in the whole world, mm -hmm. but the different diasporas there have been present for a long time. Mm -hmm. So we are dealing now with very new hybrid cultures. Yeah. But there is not one culture house actually that offers a platform for the hybrid cultures. The approach is always uh, multicultural, yeah. as in different cultures living next to yeah. each other. Yeah. And all these different cultures and the way they were approached by these houses, people from Brussels didn't even recognize themselves mm. in it anymore. So these houses ended up being whiter than white. Okay. After all the, the reforming in terms of diversitas, but they mm. stayed very white, yeah. very elitist, yeah. uh, a public coming out from, out from, the suburb, from outside the city actually, yeah. and they couldn't reach the Brussels public. Mm. So we came to a point where we realized we have to stop asking, we have to stop negotiating, we mm. have to stop, you know, be in these conversations where at the end we are always the losers. Mm. And at the same time, knowing that in the margin, the margin that is being left out by these institutions, there were amazing things happening, basically. So the idea behind the space was to open our own arts and culture center that would be a kind of a laboratorium okay. where we try out new ways of policy, new ways of offering platform mm -hmm. for the new forms of art, new forms of, of culture mm -hmm. uh, uh, that, were, that were emerging all over the place. And we started this project about three years ago. Okay. And um, this is the first time uh, as an activist, and I've, I've, I've been there for a while, mm -hmm. that we have a project that gives immediate result mm -hmm. um, in many ways. Okay. The first thing is that we are unapologetically political okay. as nice. an art and culture house. Nice. We take stands, mm. we take political stands on, on several levels when it comes to the climate, when it comes to racism, when it comes to capitalism, imperialism, colonization. <laughs> We are a hub for what we call artivism. Yeah. It's like artists yes. slash activists. Yes. Yeah. But so doesn't that make it impossible to get funding from the, from the municipality? Mm, I don't know. Well, almost. Okay. Almost <laughs> impossible. Sometimes we do get funding. It's very, very small amounts. It's just because actually they can't get around us anymore. Okay. Uh, we actually even uh, are a recognized ha okay. uh, culture house oh, in wow. Flanders. The first recognized uh, our art and culture house that doesn't uh, apply all the rules that they yeah. impose on us. Like the in, the f in the beginning when they sent us a mail saying, yes, well, listen, we have to recognize you. Recognize you. Re we are recognizing you because we have to. Okay. Not because we That doesn't to. seem very enthusiastic. They were, <laughs> they were not enthusiastic <laughs> no. in the email no. at all. But we, we met all the criteria, so okay. they had to recognize us. But then they said, and here are the conditions, the further for, conditions yeah. for recognition, like show he did his Netherlands style like her hair, so whatever, you know, okay. there, there were some conditions. And we sent back an email and I said, whatever comes with the conditions, we don't want. You can take it back. 
we don't want. And then basically they told us, uh, we looked it up, and actually we cannot enforce the conditions on you. You're mm. recognized, period. So we're recognized, not applying the rules. But did you know this when you sent back that email saying... No, I didn't. You didn't? Okay. No. Wow. <laughs> I didn't. Or I just said, if, if that's the way you know this comes, then mm. take it back. We okay. don't want it because for us, being free to say what we want to say, do what we want to do, is why we exist. So mm. we cannot... You know, we cannot apply conditions from outside because this is a grassroots, you know, a bottom-up yeah. space, place, and community. So we cannot, we cannot have that. And they accepted it. So now also they have to give subsidies, but they try, you know, like give the smallest amounts they can. But it's, it's good for us. Okay. We're happy because even those small amounts can take us, you yeah. know, a step further because it's still a very precarious place, of course, because it's not financed. Yeah. Do you have, do you have, I, I'm, I'm curious because I think the, the, the Hague uh, situation is a bit similar to that. I can't speak for all of the Netherlands, but I can definitely recognize in what you're describing that you have these white institutions that tokenize uh, uh, um, multicultural art and, and creation and um, that also think very much in boxes, like, okay, we do one uh, uh, Arab festival and then we're exactly. done for the rest of the year. We're gonna do. We're gonna find. Uh, we're gonna get a bus down to like the poor neighborhoods and and get them to come here. And then we've done all our diversity uh, and so on, but not in an integrated way that takes into account sort of the urban dynamics of creation and hybridity and and sort of how things sort of move and culture keeps growing, right? And and what you notice is that people who have who don't fit in, young people, artists who don't fit into whatever it is that these institutions think that they need that they can get away with. Um, they they're left stranding and they're left outside of the of the of the of the sort of promotional uh, stream the uh, the talent development stream they're sort of basically left to fend for themselves especially for the Hague I know some people who cannot do otherwise than end up in Amsterdam and Rotterdam or even Berlin or London to do their thing because there's just it's so to, it's so specific here and um, so I, I can totally totally see that sort of that connection. But when I think of starting things up in the similar what you're describing in The Hague, I can't think of any way that you can do that without having allies within the political sort of system that help you get away with it, that help you set it up. I, I mean, do, do you have sort of political backing or... Um, no. No. <laughs> okay, damn it. So we do have to do it ourselves. We do have to do it ourselves. It's for several reasons. It's because um, the fact, the thing is, if we want to be able to say everything we want to say mm -hmm. uh, in terms of uh, organizing, mm -hmm. resisting, building, mm -hmm. all these things, then um, it doesn't match with party politics because right. they have their agendas. It's mm -hmm. as simple as that, basically. It's not even, it is, it is also a political will from our part because we do not believe in our electoral system, in our okay. so-called Demo democratic system. So we also always call that out. We, we uh, in the space we really believe in building a different society, okay. bottom up, and just ignore the system that exists because it wasted enough of our time and energy. Mm -hmm. Now this ties really well into your book. So <laughs> Rashida Aziz wrote a book. It is called Niemand zal hier slapen vanat. I don't know if you can get close and see it. There's no zoom. There's zoom. Oh. <laughs> This is high technology. Niemand zal hier slapen vannacht. In English it translates to no one shall sleep here tonight. It is inspired from a very, very intense and beautiful poem uh, by, let, let, me, let me just, okay. Um, it's a song, right? In Kurt oh. uh, the, the, the version in the book was an interpretation by Nina Simone. Okay, yeah, awesome. Uh, you gotta, you got to get this book. To me, this book, um, it represents a lot of things. Um, aside from what you're saying about sort of developing strategies outside of sort of patriarchal white uh, 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 systems and institutions, I think this book really, for me, is something that allowed me... Okay, let me put it this way. The book... Um, sort of tackles on different, uh, through different disciplines and methods, sort of tackles whiteness as an institution and as a construct. So it looks at, for example, the historical ties of, and the historical grounding, rooting of, of whiteness. It looks at uh, sort of the philosophical underpinnings of, of whiteness. It looks at sociological effects of whiteness in the present day and in the past. It looks at 
um, anthropologically also at whiteness. I mean, this is an all-round sort of kaleidoscopic uh, intervention and analysis of what whiteness does in the most accessible ways. I mean, if you start this book, like, it's done before you realize. Like, you can't stop reading. It has a fast pace, which I think, to me, speaks a lot for the urgency of this discussion. You can read that someone is passionate about it. You can read somebody who's right in the middle of, of it. Not distant, not scientific and objective, but right in the middle of what it means to be living under our current imperialist, sexist, patriarchal, racist system. So get the book. <laughs> Do we sell it? Do we sell it here today? Okay. It's also okay. Yeah. So they're over there for the people here. Go around over there. Uh, <laughs> the book, as we've just introduced. Um, talks a lot about whiteness and about white institutions. And if we go straight to the strategies to deal with it, we're skipping a bunch of things. And I, I want to go back a little bit <laughs> to, um, I want to think, I want to know from you, like, what are the reasons for um, centering whiteness, uh, like, in your book? Like, w w like, what gave you sort of, yeah, what are the, like, why, why center whiteness? Why this analysis of whiteness, why is it important? Can I ask you that? Is that a good? Yeah, yeah, sure. To start, um, and then we're going to talk about strategies later. Sure. Um, actually, uh, like a, co a couple of years ago, when I started like getting serious about stopping acknowledging uh, the knowledge created about me, because I never, I never identified with it, and starting to create that knowledge myself and doing the research and the analysis about my condition, I ended up actually. Uh, very, very quickly realizing that everything um, that defines me and defines my condition right now could be led back to three big poles, all of them actually. Whiteness, mm -hmm. patriarchy, <coughs> and capitalism. Mm -hmm. And I remember that back in the day when I was sometimes participating in workshops or something that I would say like, try it out guys and you'll see that it will, when you trace it back, you will end up either by patriarchy, mm -hmm. whiteness, or capitalism. And we would try to do the exercise and it would, it would work every time. So that's why I started, because I mean, to me, um, maybe in this book there's more about whiteness than about patriarchy than, and about capitalism, but to me it's really the acts of those three mm -hmm. uh, systems that make up one system. Uh, or some might say patriarchy and whiteness are the pillars of the capitalist system and so on, that I realized I really had to understand how whiteness operates mm. if I wanted to understand my condition and uh, how I can resist and mm. how I can create something different and propose something different. So, yeah. Resistance is an important part of your book. And um, one of the things that sort of in an earlier conversation that we had uh, with Gloria Wecker last month, at some point it became really important to sort of define uh, how allyship works and what allyship is. And I can remember very like loudly you saying, "I don't even. I'm done with even the concept of allyship." Would you Would you like to share that with us a little bit? Because it was brilliant. <laughs> <laughs> sure. Well, that that's the thing. Th there's, there, there are a lot of conversations going on about allyship. For a couple of years I've been witnessing these conversations on the correctness of which term to use, mm -hmm. wh which content to give to the terms, who defines the content, who defines what an ally is, who is to play God actually and to decide over others who's in and who's out, out and that kind of things. And it took, it, took, it took sometimes very big proportions but sometimes especially it went into directions where I was just left puzzled with how is this relevant to liberating us okay. um, and into building concrete strategies that ho hold the promise to liberate us? And that's when, when I started to analyze the concept that I realized that, first of all, what we are fighting against, what we are, me, what I am fighting against and resisting against and what I want to see different is all the uh, fake identities imposed by the system upon mm -hmm. us that want to make us fit into boxes that suit the system for us to fit in so that th we can be played out against each other. Mm -hmm. um, 
basically. So if we want to break that, if we want to break that, we need to find uh, a way to build a society where we cannot be played against each other. Okay. Uh, and in that society, uh, we, we would not um, be defined by the system. We yeah. should not be allow. Uh, we should not allow the system to be even able to define us. Yeah. Yeah. And 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 for that, for me, I think the essence of the next step in the strategy is to deconstruct those identities mm -hmm. who were created by the system. And we know that race is one of these mm -hmm. identities created by the system. Gender is another identity created by the system. So if we want to deconstruct them, what does skin color mean then? No. And what does identity, one's identity or even political identity be linked to then? Yeah. What can we be linked to? And that's when I started building this, uh, how do you say this, socle of, of, of values mm -hmm. that were mine. Because mm -hmm. I started thinking, what does identify me? Okay, I do not, the, the system tells me I'm a woman. I've deconstructed that. Mm -hmm. I, I ended up looking like this. So okay. the system still perceives me as a woman. Mm -hmm. But actually the word woman is not, is not is not, doesn't define me anymore, yeah. but I do not have the vocabulary yet. I just know that the concept of woman doesn't define me, mm. the way that we understand it. Yeah, so, are you, so basically you're saying, like, we don't need allies as long as we all position ourselves as, as within sort of like our individual relationships with the system, with these constructs, becomes sort of like, it becomes horizontal. There is no longer somebody that comes and helps me out get out of, out of the oppression, but they sort of deconstruct exactly. their whiteness. In and the concept of allyship, basically you, you accept the systemic identities. Mm -hmm. Because a man that wants to be an ally to feminism, for instance, feminism, which is perceived as a struggle, seen as a struggle of women for equality, mm -hmm. men can be allies to that struggle, but that means they accept the yeah. gender constructions. Yeah. So to me, that's where the problem is. If a man wants to be a warrior in, in the fight, in the struggle against uh, oppression, then a man has to deconstruct himself as the norm. Because if the woman is discriminated, it's only because the man has been defined as yeah. the norm. So deconstruct that norm. That's where your work lies. So to me, if you still want to use the, the concept ally, then let it be uh, to define someone who is deconstructing themselves and deconstructing the identity imposed mm. on them. And for a man, that means it's going to cost you. Yeah. Because that means you're going to refuse to be the norm. And refusing to be the norm also costs you something. You actually bring yourself down to the level of those yeah. who are oppressed by refusing the identity that you've been given mm. by so the system. Yeah, okay. That's interesting. I think... I think um, I really like what you're saying because it, it places um, all of us, whether you know, we're from dominant groups or otherwise, it places us within an interested position towards the deconstruction and dismantling of these positions that either give us privilege or not. And that's an interesting thought and, and a challenge, I think, for people who, for example, are a man to think through how, like, what is the, you know, if I position myself as an adversary to that system, to the construct of man, you know, what kind of uh, intervention do you then place? Like, indeed, dismantling of your own privilege becomes then, you know, what you're actually doing, right? And that's yeah. a challenge. Um, but I think sometimes when I look at sort of the way that this privilege system builds things like uh, 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 like white innocence, for example, eh? this, 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 this inability to, th well, this centering of one's own sort of like intentions and well-meaning intentions as sort of the, the, the litmus test, the condition on whether or not somebody's racist or not. Like, I don't intend to, so I cannot be. <laughs> um, I don't want to have all this privilege, so I don't have it. Well, <laughs> you'd still, you know? And I try to think of also, like, how do you get people to understand that whiteness or ma masculinity, maleness, is, is something that, is an, uh, uh, that, they, that they should want to get out of, that they should want to be this, that, you know? Like, how do they... How do you, or is it something I have to convince them of? I don't know. But like, how do people get to a process where they go like, I'm a man, I'm a white person, but I want to get rid of it. And that I think is quite challenging, no? Me personally. What is the vested interest? What is the? Me personally, I don't care. Mm. Whether there is a vested interest for individuals or not, I don't care. I know there is one for me. Mm. I know that I have a community of people 
that have a vested interest, we are working together on this. And whomever thinks they have a vested interest can join. But I'm going to stop waiting for people to understand whether they have a vested interest or not, okay. or to try to convince them. Simply because we tried to for a long time, for a very long time, whether it's women, whether it's black people, people of color, whether it's queer people, we've, we've tried to no. convince people that have, they have a, a vested interest in many, many ways. And actually we just ended up losing a lot of our time and energy mm -hmm. that we could have been spending in the people that know they have a vested interest mm -hmm. and that we should be the ones to organize ourselves in terms, you know, to, 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 to deconstruct. And I think there's a lot of work to be done there. And I, I've also noticed that when communities come together in, in safe spaces, in non-mixed spaces, all of a sudden the knowledge created there, the knowledge that is and will be liberating us just mm. gets to an, a whole other level all mm. of a sudden when you start focusing on that. So that's where my focus is. That's where my focus yeah. was with writing this book. Too. I think it's really interesting because you, you talk about knowledge production and um, that's something that is very, like, very central to your book. Like this is a book of someone who has done the research and who has a very clear overview of how things are interrelated, interrelated and connected in the society that we live in. I read one of the re reviews that um, that you sent me was one, the only negative one so far that is out there. Like her book has been received very positively in Belgium. Um, and that's something of a rarity. In the Netherlands, we have a completely different experience when people, women of color, specifically like Gloria Wecker, Anusha Nzume, when they speak out, I mean, the, but anyways, that's a different, that's a different question. <laughs> Um, but what I find interesting that uh, this guy then goes like, oh, comp comp like a conspiracy theories. Well, to me, you're obviously interconnecting and linking things very well that you know need to be linked. And and I was thinking about that process of how do you come to collect so much knowledge and the way you talk about having done it, like you democratize this study, this analysis of whiteness. You root it in yourself. Could you could you talk a little bit more on that? Well, first of all, I don't have an academic background. Mm -hmm. I never went to uni. Um, I don't have a college degree. I'm just uh, a very curious person. Um, very, very, I'm guessing very high level of empathy mm -hmm. all my life. Never find, found places where I can, you know, where I can just uh, do all the things I feel I should be doing wherever I was engaging whenever I was engaging in some project or starting something I was always I was always like oh my god this is so this is this is still leaving out so many people so many of us or, or so many mm -hmm. aspects of my being there's only one part of me that is taken in account in no. here and no. you know and then the more you you encounter these things the more you realize that what is created of knowledge about our condition out there doesn't match our reality. Yeah. And, but my reality, I did see and feel and experience that it was shared by many, many, many other people. Mm. And um, I wasn't reading academic uh, 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 research and knowledge created, created about us and my condition and our shared condition. First of all, because it was too theoretic and it didn't match with mm. what was happening here. and. And what I, what, what I was experiencing, and also when you're on this side of the spectrum in our society, even theoretic knowledge feels as violence. Mm -hmm. Like it's the, this isn't about me. Yeah. So, as I I think it's simply because I'm a person that I, I've always been like this. This is something that's intrinsically part of me. Something doesn't exist. I need it. Let me create it. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> that's actually how this book came. It's yeah. just because I've done a lot of many different forms of expression before this. Mm -hmm. I was a fashion designer. I've, been, I've done painting. I've done interior architecture. I've done many stuff. I had several lives. You but have a very interesting, over, <laughs> if you go over Google, she has a very interesting CV. Google tells you this woman has been everywhere. <laughs> I love it. Go on. But this book basically was just because <clears throat> from within the space, I was engaging with this, with, with all these magic mm. communities that I started also discovering. I created the platform because I knew they were there. I knew we were there, mm. but I didn't know the extent of us. Yeah. 
I didn't know the extent of the magic of us. Mm -hmm. I discovered all of that after I created the place because mm -hmm. now that the physical place is there, they started also finding the place. Mm -hmm. and, and that's where I wanted to write this book because I'm like, we deserve to know mm -hmm. in, in, in our own words, in our own narrative. I needed to find a new language, a new narrative, um, one of ours, a language that is ours, the mm -hmm. language that we share when we talk about ourselves and mm -hmm. our conditions. Because I never found a book, I, I, I do read a lot, mm -hmm. but I never found a book that speaks about us in our language, in yeah. the terms that we use. But I did, have ex I did experience the magic of the conversations, mm -hmm. so I wanted to find a language that translates that magic into a book, basically. You did that very well. <laughs> I, I honestly... Uh, I'm trying to think of ways to like segue what you're saying about magic to healing. Mm. Let me think. Hmm. Let me think. Be creative here. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, magic in a lot of in a lot of traditions of magic, where I come from at least, a lot of these traditions in Burundi are connected to these concepts of healing one another mm -hmm. and of, of of sort of inter interventions towards healing. And one of the things you talk about in your book, and we've talked about it before as well, is about sort of the cost of living in racist, in, in, you know, uh, uh, patriarchal capitalist systems and the cost of it to our bodies, the cost of it to our minds. Um, and I wonder, you know, can you connect that to this magic you're talking about in these spaces? Is it like healing? Are these spaces healing? And could you also talk about um, the cost, this, 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 this violence and how it impacts our, our bodies and our minds? Yes, I've, um, I've started working on a documentary about two years ago. I don't know if we talked yeah, about this. Yeah, a little I did. bit, but I want no more. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's, it's called The Blind Spot, mm -hmm. because I wanted to address this one huge blind spot of ours in our society, and that is the physical and mental illness um, caused by uh, growing up in a system that is hostile mm -hmm. to one or several parts of your identity whether you're a woman or you're black or you're queer or you're a Muslim or Muslima, growing up in a violent context causes a lot of harm. I know I've done, the, I've done some research and I realized that um, in Europe we're nowhere in the, uh, concerning that debate, or at least two years ago. I've seen that now it starts. There's okay. some research starting. Even this morning as I saw actually a new article about children and the effect of racism on children okay. in schools. But most of the research I found was made in the United States mm -hmm. by black professors. Mm -hmm. And actually they were there, I found that there they were on the verge of having traumas caused by racism recognized as post-traumatic stress syndrome. Mm -hmm. That the only thing still standing of the way of the recognition was the P of post. Mm -hmm. Because this is ongoing. Yeah. We have to find a way to heal from the traumas while they are still ongoing. Mm -hmm. and, and this is something that became very, you know, I, I became obsessed by the idea because when I started pay t paying attention, I noticed that maybe two out of three people of color around me that I knew mm -hmm had some kind of illness, whether mental or physical, or that couldn't be cured, or that wasn't, you know, that was ongoing for years. Whether um, people call it depression, or burnout, mm -hmm. or um, uh, immunity mm -hmm. system diseases, and these kind of things, mm -hmm. that I started noticing that most of the people I know were suffering from one, one kind of or, or another, and I started doing, my kind of research, the one that is not acknowledged <laughs> by the system, of course, it's just me in conversations that how, how I do research and I try to read a lot. And, but then I started noticing that there was also a kind of a taboo. These kind of illnesses were still pinned back to the individual. Mm. It, they were being individualized. I didn't find anything here in Europe, any debate or discussion about how is the system making us yeah. sick. sick yeah. So that's when I decided that, okay, that documentary doesn't exist, I have to make like it. <laughs> good answer, great answer. Yeah. Um, wow, that's going to be, um, I'm looking forward to seeing that. Also because I think, I, I recognize that very much in the LGBT community, specifically LGBT community of color, 
um, issues of health, um, issues of, of mental health are, 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 are a major issue. Like most people I know, and we, we see that especially, for example, with gay men, uh, uh, gay men of color as well, the use of drugs, uh, 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 the, the abuse of drugs, let me put it that way, the abuse of drugs and, and unprotected sex and so on. It's something which is alive very much in our communities, and I think it's been, and I think it has a lot to do, um, I don't think we're faulty people because we're queer, I think we're people who are trying to survive a system that is queerphobic, and uh, and and the complication of being women, of being of being of being trans, of being black, of being Muslim, you know, just um, yeah, makes it uh, all the more daunting and all the bigger. And I think research definitely would need to be done. I think one of the like Gloria Becker also says in uh, that one of the issues in in academia, in in Western sort of in Western European. Science is that the idea of race is, is 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 sort of discounted as not like it's considered not a relevant factor anymore, because we're post-race in Europe, especially in the Netherlands. So we don't have issues with race anymore. So when we research these things, we don't ask people their race. We don't check at all. So we don't have the figures, right? And and so it becomes anecdotal because, um, but it is a pattern. It's a system. Yeah. Thank you for sharing that with us. And in your book, you talk about that as well. And that was really. Grateful for someone to say it very much. Okay, how do I go, how do we go to <laughs> more? Oh, let's talk about the reception of your book. See, I want to hear from you. We we have some very specific experiences here in the Netherlands of people, uh, black women, uh, speaking out, and it goes it's it's generational. So we have Philomena said. Mm. Uh, all the way to Anusha Zume. These are women, different ages, different sort of well. Both Gloria Becker and 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 and, and, uh, and Philomena said are more academic, definitely. Um, but the attacks are so vile; they're very personal. There's trolling. There's you know respected media critics and journalists just going at them. Um, but your experience is very different. Can you can you tell us about that? Yeah. In Belgium. Yeah, but first of all, I don't Things think Things might go really wrong for you here in the Netherlands after this interview. Okay. <laughs> no worries. That's what I, I wanted to say. I don't think the difference is between Netherlands and Belgium mm -hmm. because their experience is the same experience I have up to this book. Okay. Because I've already been in the public eye uh, okay. before for things I was doing and saying and writing. I used to even write opinions for the mainstream media. Mm -hmm. Whenever I would write something, sometimes even just for a Facebook post, it happened once that for one Facebook post, my name was trending on Twitter worldwide for 24 hours, all hate mail, oh, wow. just for a Facebook post. So I've been there. I mean, it's the same in Belgium. It's okay. completely the same. Always has been up to this book. Mm -hmm. So now we're still, you know, having all this conversation among ourselves trying to understand mm -hmm. why it didn't happen with this book. And so there are several theories, but mm -hmm. they're just, you know, theories. theories. Theorize theories. further. <laughs> Theorize on. Let us know. because Some of us might want to apply them. Well, one of, the th <laughs> one of the theories is that, as I say in the introduction of this book, is that um, I'm done. I'm done explaining. Mm -hmm. I'm done negotiating my humanity. Um, I'm 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 cutting loose. Mm -hmm. I'm I'm cutting the system loose. Mm -hmm. I am turning my back to the system. I am turning my back to everything and everyone that was always keeping me in this position where I had to explain mm -hmm. over and over and over again. You know, like. Huh, how can you be a Muslim and a feminist at the same time? Mm -hmm. You know, that's incompatible. And then you'd go like, you don't even know if I'm a Muslim. Or yeah. are, are you? Mm, none of your fucking business. Yeah. And then I'm like, oh, but this is relevant. No, it's not. That's the thing. And, you know, this ongoing, ongoing unhealthy situations that we've, me personally, just me, I've been in them for decades. Mm. And at some point I was like, okay, it did take me a burnout. Though, but after the burnout, when I started, uh, but all of this you can read in the book. When I started read doing the book, yeah. <laughs> started doing the deconstruction of the systemic, mm. artificial identities. When I started doing um, uh, uh, all the deconstruction, I noticed that actually I've been on my knees all my life. Mm. I've been ripped away of my freedom and of my dignity. 
But then at some point I came to realize my freedom can be taken away from me. That's beyond my power. But my dignity, I gave it away mm. by staying on my knees, mm. by answering all those questions, by trying to explaining, by just, you know, pleading for some kind of recognition. Mm. Uh, let's stand equality. Let's stand, you know, like just... And then I, I realized that actually I was doing this to myself, mm -hmm. that, that maybe I could just get up from that position, turn my back, mm -hmm. and see what's there, and focus on that. Mm -hmm. And I tried it out, and the burnout really helped. I don't think I could have done that before, but you know mm -hmm. when, when you have a burnout, it's like, fuck it. I have nothing to lose. Mm. I tried it out, and that's where the magic started happening. And I was like, wow. Yeah. This whole Wakanda world that was <laughs> hidden from us. Yeah. I was waiting for a Black Panther reference. <laughs> Sorry. I was like, <laughs> but here it is. There you are. Black Panther. God. <laughs> Wakanda forever. You know, that we just didn't see because we're kept hostage in yeah. this position where we were negotiating our, our humanity with our with our backs to the wall and on our knees. And now that I've experienced the freedom of standing up and turning your back, there's no going back from that point, yeah. basically. Yeah. And I think, that's, that's, I think it's the tone in that book. Yeah. That yeah. when you read it, you're like, okay, this is, if I say something about this book, I'll actually just be saying something about myself. Yeah. I love it because you add in the, you have to read this book, you add in this, in the book, a correspondence that you have with uh, an organization that you had applied for funding for, for a movie Fuff, thing, yeah. and the organization at some point goes like, well, you know, you you definitely don't really get how racism works, and you're totally not uh, engaging, uh, you're not, your strategy towards sort of bringing the, pro the, the project and explaining, you know, what's wrong, isn't, you know, um, like, gemoedelijk, isn't gezellig, basically, just samengevat. And you, you put in, in the book your letter back to them, which concludes with, I, I'm just going to give it away, spoilers, with, I don't care what you think. <laughs> and I think, that I think anybody who has read this book and who feels like, I'm going to tell this woman where she's wrong or right, the message is sent. Like, I don't need to hear it. I don't, okay. But what I really like what you describe about uh, burnout, I also had a burnout three years ago, and I think one of the things that saved me was feminism. And I met black feminist women in Amsterdam mostly uh, who really invested their time and, and, and their care to explain me um, the way forward, the way out of the system. And I think um, what you're describing and the fact that you then invest in a book like this, that you invest in writing it down, that you invest in a space um, in safe space for and, and a platform for other people of color to c make together, create together, and and, and 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 share their talents and their ideas and their their world of view with the world, um, reminds me very much of those women and of that tradition of of connecting and of helping somebody out and sort of explain. Like I don't think I would have come to a point of even coming out as trans if it hadn't been for feminists who had sort of helped me uncover my own internalized sexism and internalized transphobia, mm. right? Mm -hmm. Like, I had so much fear for everything that was feminine about me, and I hated it very deeply. Um, even living in the gay community was something that had become something that I was so afraid of acknowledging that only when these women sort of, you know, introduced to me um, uh, the, the even how the possibility of deconstructing femininity and masculinity and, and being proud of, of, of womanhood. And, you know, I would have never gotten to a point where I could embrace all these different facets of who I am. And, and I think one of the things I've had to do as well is also say goodbye to the capitalist dream, you know, of being, of being okay and being safe and having enough money when I get older. I mean, the, the, the crisis that the, in 2007 that helped you know, the realization that you can save up all the money you want and then one day these banks just make it go poof. Helped, definitely. But um, it was also in dialogue with anti-capitalist activist women um, that was really made it clear to me how sort of the privileges that comes with fulfilling that capitalist dream, how oppressive they are towards other women around the world. You know, uh, and you talk about that in your book as well, that connectivity between uh, uh, the sort of 
you call it white feminism, eh? where it's like you need to be on somebody's back to get up. You know? And there is a part in your book that I really think is brilliant. And I would like, because I'm not sure whether we still have been, I don't know how long we've been doing this already. But <laughs> I, I would love for you to read this part. It is in Dutch. I'm sorry for the people who don't speak Dutch. But this is a beautiful piece of writing. And I would like you, could you read that with us? And I think that that would be the conclusion for today. But, yeah. <coughs> Waar er onrecht is, sluimert verzet. Waar er patriarchale onderdrukking is, broeit feministisch protest. Vrouwen hebben altijd gerebelleerd tegen de minderwaardige plaats die hen werd toegewezen. Lang voor de eerste Franse vrouw zich op het einde van de 19e eeuw vier een feministe noemde, hebben over de hele wereld vrouwen zich met lijf en leden verzet tegen de terreur van het patriarchaat. Alleen werden die vrouwen weggewist uit de geschiedenis. Zij werden onzichtbaar gemaakt. Voor hen is geen plaats in de geschiedenisboeken. En als ze zo onmiskenbaar groot zijn dat zelfs historici niet om hen heen kunnen, dan worden ze geseksualiseerd. Dan doet men alsof enkel hun schoonheid van tel was. Het overkwam de Egyptische koningin Cleopatra. In de orientalistische verbeelding werd zij een buikdansende en oogverblindende schoonheid die de machtigste mannen van Rome om haar vinger wond. Maar uit oude Arabische teksten rest een heel andere figuur op. Daarin leren we Cleopatra kennen als een briljante vrouw die elke week met de grootste wetenschappers van haar tijd overlegde en die zeven talen sprak. Cleopatra beheerste wiskunde, chemie en filosofie. Twee Arabische schrijvers beweerden duizend jaar geleden zelfs dat Cleopatra eigenhandig experimenten uitvoerde en de groeistadia van een foetus beschreef in een boek. Het verschil tussen die twee versies van één en dezelfde historische figuur. De ene is het product van een op hol geslagen seksistische en racistische fantasie, losjes gebaseerd op de verslagen van de winnaars van de geschiedenis. De andere steunt wellicht op originele teksten uit de tijd van Cleopatra die ondertussen verloren zijn gegaan. Deze bijzonder waardevolle Arabische teksten van duizend jaar geleden werden op hun beurt uit de geschiedenis geschrapt. Ze worden enkel nog als curiosum behandeld. Als iets dat door zonderlingen aan de kleinste faculteit van de universiteiten wordt bestudeerd, omdat ze niet deel uitmaken van de Europese hersenschim van witheid. Seksualiseren is niet de enige manier om de rol van vrouwen te minimaliseren. Beroemde vrouwen worden ook vaak als heks bestempeld. Dihia leidde in de zevende eeuw het verzet van de Berbers tegen de oprukkende Arabi Arabische troepen. Zij verdreef het Arabische leger tot buiten de grenzen van het huidige Libië en stond vijf jaar aan het hoofd van een vrije Berberstaat. In het jaar 700 werd ze uiteindelijk toch verslagen door een reusachtig Arabisch leger. Dihia ging de geschiedenis in als Kahina, wat in het Arabisch heks betekent. Om in het Witte Westen als feminist erkend te worden, moet je je overtuiging neergeschreven hebben in een boek en moet je bovendien liefst zelf ook wit zijn. Het helpt zelfs niet als je de allereerste persoon bent aan wie ooit een tekst werd toegeschreven. En Hedwana werd geboren omstreeks 2300 voor Christus. Ze liet een literaire oeuvre na en is daarmee de allereerste auteur op wie we een naam kunnen plakken. Ze schreef, You are not a trophy, not some kind of ornament, a decoration of the sky. You're the priest, you're the healer, you're the wild god who turns her ear towards heaven, who digs her feet into the earth, who whispers peace and wisdom in the wind. Inanna, when I look at you, I see a prophetess with love and truth blazing from her crown. I see a figure glowing in the light, pure and simple and dangerous. I see now, Inanna, you are on fire. Vertaling door Kas Dalglish. Okay. Eén dag na de inauguratie van Trump zong Alicia Keys op het podium van de Women's March. Feeling the catastrophe. But she knows she can fly away. 
Oh, she got both feet on the ground, and she's burning it down. She got her head in the clouds, and she's not backing down. This girl is on fire. Van de kleitabletten van Enhedouana tot de gebalde vuist van Alicia Keys, het feminisme gevat in een cirkel van 4300 jaar. Binnen die cirkel hebben miljoenen vrouwen gestreden tegen het onrecht dat hen werd aangedaan. Als we de, suffrage de suffragettes die aan het einde van de 19e eeuw en het begin van de 20e eeuw streden voor vrouwenstemrecht de eerste golf van feministen noemen, in welke golf zat een hedouane dan? Tot welke golf behoorde de Turkse vrouw die in 1869 in het veelgelezen we weekblad Teraki i Muhadarat, de vooruitgang van moslima's, schreef Zijn wij niet in staat kennis en behendigheid op te doen? Wat is het verschil tussen onze benen, onze ogen en hersenen en die van hen? Zijn wij dan geen mensen? Is het alleen ons geslacht dat ons veroordeelt tot dit lot? Niemand met enig gezond verstand kan dit aanvaarden. Die woorden klinken als een echo van de beroemde toespraak die Sojourner Truth, een tot slaaf gemaakte vrouw die na haar bevrijding een kopstuk werd van de strijd van de afschaffing van de slavernij, 18 jaar eerder gaf in de Amerikaanse staat Ohio op een conferentie voor vrouwenrechten. Die man daar zegt dat vrouwen geholpen moeten worden om in een koets te stappen of over een grippel gedragen moeten worden en overal de beste plaatsen krijgen. Niemand hielp mij ooit in een koets of over een modderpoel of gaf mij de beste plaats. En ben ik dan geen vrouw? Kijk naar me. Kijk naar mijn arm. Ik heb geploegd en geplant en hooi verzameld in schuren en geen man kon me bijhouden. En ben ik dan geen vrouw? Ik gaf het leven aan dertien kinderen en zag hoe de meeste van hen verkocht werden als slaaf. En ik schreeuwde mijn moeder verdriet uit en niemand behalve Jezus hoorde me. En ben ik dan geen vrouw? Ben ik dan geen mens, vroeg de Turkse schrijfster aan de mannen in haar omgeving. Ben ik dan geen vrouw, vroeg ze Journer aan het publiek van een conferentie die zich boog over vrouwenrechten. In de zaal zaten hoofdzakelijk witte, rijke vrouwen die zich ongemakkelijk voelden bij de gedachte dat een zwarte vrouw het woord nam. Zijn die vrouwen van kleur dan geen feministen, zouden we nu kunnen schrijven. Drie golven van feminisme tellen kan je alleen als je een heel beperkt perspectief hebt op wat feminisme is. Als je blik beperkt wordt tot de geschiedenis van het Witte Westen van de voorbije 150 jaar. boek moet je gewoon hebben. Het is gewoon heel intens. Ik, uh, ja, um, wauw. Ik, ik kan er niks aan toevoegen. Alright. Zelf. <laughs> ik wil je heel erg bedanken voor je komst. Heel erg gedaan, Ola. Ik wil je ook heel, heel erg bedanken dat je dit überhaupt hebt gedaan. Ik weet uh, 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 wat de risico's zijn in de hedendaagse maatschappij waarin we leven en ook dus in België, wat je beschrijft. En je neemt daar meer risico. En, um, oh, in English, wait a minute, I forgot, <laughs> we're in English. Oops, <laughs> let's go back to English. I want to yeah. thank you and, uh, for, for coming here, and I really want to thank you for writing this book. I think, um, I know what kind of risks people take, especially women of color, take when they do what you do, and, um, and, uh, and I want to be grateful for that, and I also want to be grateful for the way that you give people, uh, other people of color, um, something to hold on to, you know, something... Um, and I think this book is that it is really is a bit of a talisman, you know. Like I have a like I have a little altar. And I put it's one of my <laughs> pieces in the altar. Um, it inspired me a lot, and I think it will inspire a lot of people. Thank you so much for coming here. My yeah. pleasure. Yeah. Thank you. I'm gonna give you a hug. <laughs> yeah. oh, well, thank you all for being here. I mean, we're done now. We're done. Let's go and have some coffee and uh, and go buy a book. And uh, thank you very much for being. Yeah. <laughs>